So a very warm welcome to Worcester's online academic lecture series. I'm Patricia Clavin, uh, the Professor of Modern History, and I'm delighted to introduce tonight's lecture entitled The Agricultural Revolution or Nature's Circular Economy in 19th Century France, being given by uh, my colleague, Dr. Michael Drolet. Dr. Drolet is Senior Research Fellow in the History of Political Thought at Worcester. He's an intellectual historian with very wide ranging interests, academically, chronologically in the 18th, 19th and 20th century philosophy and in French political, social and economic thought. He's written widely on French liberalism, French romantic socialism uh, and contemporary French thought. Um, he's published very widely. You can find details of all of his uh, many books on the website. Um, but in particular, uh, I'd like to highlight his 2003 volume on Tocqueville, Democracy and Social Reform. And just a year later, he published the Postmodernism Reader Foundational Texts. He's currently got three book projects on the go, including a book on the San Simonian and statesman uh, Michel Chevalier. Tonight's talk is part of a wider series of events supporting the college's new initiative um, of annual interdisciplinary research themes, which this year is sustainability, as well as aiming to increase biodiversity on the college estate and reduce our carbon emissions, the college is committed to widening and deepening our research on, on sustainability itself by using the unique college environment to facilitate interdisciplinary research. And such is the scale of the challenge of sustainability, really interdisciplinarity and multidisciplinarity is the only way to address them. Our particular goal is to establish clusters of fully funded graduate studentships and postdoctoral early career opportunities to work together on solving sustainability problems. The initiative is supported by the wealth of academic expertise on sustainability across the fellowship at Worcester. And Michael is a shining example of this expertise, and if I may say of, of collegiality that underpins it. In keeping with the established format, the talk is being recorded. Michael will speak for about 40 minutes or so, which will leave us five to 10 minutes for q and I strongly encourage you to post your questions in the Q&A section under Zoom. Uh, Michael, the floor is yours. Patricia, thank you very much. And thank you for that extremely generous introduction. I, I'm really happy to be here. Um, so uh, I wanna talk about food. Um, our way of growing, transporting, and eating food is presently in crisis. UK farmers are struggling to buy seed, feed, fertilizer, herbicides, and pesticides. They cannot afford the price of diesel fuel or the huge capital outlays on farm machinery. The situation is no better in other European countries. In France, Belgium, Germany, Ireland, the Netherlands, farmers have all taken to the streets. The cost of machinery and artificial fertilizers is now outstripped by more than 100% the cost of human labor in European agriculture. The economics of farming are increasingly forbidding. And nature is against farming too. Floods are predicted to destroy over 40% of this year's UK wheat crop. Globally, there's a shortage of wheat and barley. Rice and potatoes are in short supply brought on by too little and then too much rain. And those ubiquitous staples, maize and soybeans that appear in nearly everything we eat from animal feed to the syrup that grows into your cornflakes to the emulsifier that's in your bread and just about every other processed food have been significantly impacted by droughts, wildfires, hail and floods. If these Old Testament woes weren't enough, the wars in Ukraine and Gaza attacks on international shipping in the Gulf of Aden and the Red Sea, and bottlenecks in the Panama Canal, have all had an important impact on global agriculture and the price of our food. In the UK, where the agricultural revolution has firm roots, farming is highly industrialized and monopolized. In 2020, 71% of UK land area was used for agricultural production, the majority of this for grazing rather than crops. Farms of over 1,000 acres make up 54% of the UK's total form farmland. In the UK, sorry, in the EU, the trend is similar. 38% of the total land area of the EU is devoted to agriculture. At the same time as the total number of farms is in steep decline. 
The agricultural input sector is also highly concentrated, with just a handful of farms dominating global markets in for key inputs, including seeds, agrochemicals, farm machinery, and fertilizers. In the EU, five seed companies control around 75% of the EU maize market share, and four companies control around 86% of the sugar beet market. The three companies, Bayer, Cotiva, Sengeta, control over 50% of the global seed market. The same is true for agricultural producers. Five companies account for 90% of the 19.5 million chickens slaughtered each week in the UK. And just as in agricultural inputs and producers sectors, the agricultural retail market is dominated by big players. In the UK, Tesco's and Sainsbury's together account for 42.2% of market share, with Morrison's, Asda, Aldi, Lidl, and the co-op accounting for more than 44%. In France, five chains dominate the market, accounting for 41% of market share, while in Germany, Lidl, Aldi, and Edeka dominate 37% of the market. With these economies of scales and concentrations, it would be fair to say that the agricultural revolution is really an industrial revolution in farming. Over the last 150 years, agriculture has been transformed into industry with a net global worth of 3.7 trillion US dollars, according to the FAO. As with the industrial revolution of the 19th century, the industrial revolution in agriculture is global in its reach. The UK imports food from all, over 180 countries. Over 50% of its food, including 85% of its vegetables, is imported. UK supply chains are amongst the longest in the world, but the, U, but the UK isn't the only country with long supply chains. France, the country of the farmer's market, has seen an impressive increase in its food miles. In 1890, fruit and vegetables traveled no more than 100 kilometers to reach Paris. Now the average is 790 kilometers, though that is dwarfed by UK food miles, which stand at nearly 3,000 kilometers. To these industrial changes in production and distribution of food, we must add those of consumption. While we can't yet speak of Filipino, uh, Filippo Marinetti's La Cucina for Futurista, with its diet of sunshine soup and aero food, UK consumers, have never had a larger range of futuristically prepared foods. Take Miss Molly's futurist kitchen recipe for ice cream, reconstituted skim milk concentrate, partially reconstituted Y powder, glucose syrup, sugar, dextrose, palm stearine, palm oil, palm kernel oil, emulsifier, mono and diglyceride fatty acids, stabilizers, gargum, sodium algitate, colors, carotenes, and mystery, presumably synthetic vanilla flavorings. Today, along with Americans, UK consumers are the largest consumers of ultra-processed food in the world. Among 60% of the average UK consumer diet and 75% of school meals is ultra-processed, compared with 10.2% in Portugal and 13.4% in Italy, where Marinetti's dream of abolishing pasta was never realized. These concentrations or efficiencies of scale in production, distribution, and consumption of food are all features of the agricultural revolution or the industrialization of agriculture. Today, scales of production and consumption are impressive. Yet these scales of production and consumption also follow a logic and established trends that give rise to worrying contradictions. The food we eat, that which nourishes life is, in its transported, processed, concentrated, and convenient forms, posing risks to our physical and mental health with cardiovascular and obesity-related illnesses on a steep rise. But there's another and equally worrying health problem with the industrial agricultural revolution. That is the problem of the planet's health. In our quest to feed the planet, we are subjecting it to incalculable stress. Our ultra-processed diets rely on key base ingredients, soybean oil, palm oil, rapeseed oil, and sunflower, four oils that make up 90% of the global market, 
rely on industrial specialization that come from monocultures and their economies of scale. Palm oil plantations alone account for 10% of permanent global cropland. The UN's Food and Agricultural Association uh, Organization estimates that industrial agriculture is one of the major causes of global deforestation. More than half of global forest loss is due to conversion of forests into cropland, with livestock grazing responsible for almost 40% of forest loss. The UK, with its impressive global supply chains, is a significant consumer of commodities linked to deforestation. Industrial agriculture's global supply chains and its scales of production and consumption harm the planet in other ways. The, US, the UN estimates that over 17% of total global food production, or between 770 to 819 billion pounds annually, goes to waste. The UK alone accounts for just over 19 billion pounds in annual food waste or 2.5 billion tons of food wasted. This waste accounts for 38% of total energy usage in the global food system, or 3% of global greenhouse gas emissions, the same as international shipping. In an industrial farming nation such as the UK, agriculture accounts for more than 10% of UK greenhouse gases. In addition to the 3% of global greenhouse gas emissions, the UN's Food and Agricultural Assist uh, Organization reports that agriculture accounts for 70% of water abstractions worldwide. And this figure is set to rise as intensive agriculture demands more and more water while at the same time compacting soils, diminishing their porosity, microbi microbial diversity, and ability to retain water. Industrial agriculture's intensive use of fertilizers, insecticides, and herbicides play a major role in water pollution. Farms discharge large quantities of agrochemicals, organic matter, drug residues, microplastics, sediments, agrochemicals, and saline drainage into water bodies. In the European Union, 38% of lakes, rivers, and streams are significantly under pressure from agricultural pollution. Industrial agriculture's intensive use of chemicals, which has a negative effect on soil compaction, their microbial life, fertility, and ability to retain water, increase the need for more chemicals and more water. A 2021 House of Commons report noted that, quote, the UK's agriculture sector relies on natural capital, and the degradation of this natural capital poses an underlying threat to the UK's ability to produce food. The ecosystem services from natural capital provide key inputs to food production. I love that sentence. It doesn't make any sense to me. Ecosystem services from natural capital provide key inputs to food production. And I go on, and it goes on to say, which often go uncounted, as does the impact of agriculture on the environment which produces them. The UK is not unique in this around the world, and understanding and adapting to food to produce food sustainably and to maintain and improve natural capital stocks in the long term is key. But how is how to maintain and improve natural capital stocks when financial pressures demand further intensification? and economies of scale. The figures speak for themselves. UK farmers have seen their incomes fall by over 60% in the last six years. And the figures are similar for our European counterparts. With the EU now about to overturn nearly 30 years of reform to the common agricultural policy and reintroduce guaranteed minimum pricing. Industrial agriculture's long rap sheet has led to an important reassessment of its revolutionary promises. The organic farming and regenerative farming movements are among the many interested in complicated responses, but they are unlikely to have a significant impact in the future. The pressures to feed the planet's growing number of inhabitants, consumers' desires for cheap and convenient food, large economic actors from banks and hedge funds to chemical and industrial machinery companies from global food ban brands to global supermarkets, all have no interest 
inorganic or regenerative farming. But this only partly explains why we are not experiencing an altogether different and altogether sustainable agricultural revolution. There's something strange and important going on here. The industrial revolution in agriculture has had the same effect as the revolution in industry. In his account of the clear benefits of the division of labor, Adam Smith also warned in his Wealth of Nations of what he called the mental mutilation of the worker. As the worker's task became more and more specialized, so too his understanding of the world around him shrank. What Smith did not envisage was how industry's effects on the shrinking of the worker's intellect took on a different form in the rest of society. The enlightenment of which Smith was an internal part gave birth to a profound paradox. Just as it embodied the advancement of knowledge, the enlightenment also engendered an optimism in humanity's ability to conquer all before it. As our knowledge of the world grew more and more detailed, and as our technologies became more and more sophisticated, we also became more and more remote from nature and the world around us. This is what happened with the industrial revolution of agriculture. Our relationship to food, to the soil, has since the origins of the industrial agricultural revolution become more and more remote. This is reflected in an unquestioning acceptance of foods that are not foods. That edible petroleum product, which is your coffee whitener, or Miss Molly's ice cream, which is an ice cream. It's also reflected in our ignorance of the hidden cost of industrial food. If we account for industrial agriculture's impact on climate change and biodiversity loss, then as a 2021 Rockefeller Foundation report observed, the true cost of producing food is three times higher than what we spend on it. A new report from the Food Systems Economic Commission, the Economics of Food Systems Transformation, lays out these costs starkly, and I quote, the recent evolution of food systems has fueled some of the greatest and gravest challenges facing humanity, notably persistent hunger, undernutrition, the obesity epidemic, loss of biodiversity, environmental damage, and climate change. The economic value of this human suffering and planetary harm is well above 10 trillion US dollars a year more than the food systems contribute to global GDP. In short, our food systems are destroying more value than they create. Change is imperative, but the pressures against it are great. A pessimistic assessment would be that corporate interests are so powerful and our mentality to food and nature so irredeemably, irredeemably antithetical to them that the change that will occur will not be favorable to food, nature, or humanity. A more optimistic assessment sees positive change in our attitudes to food and nature. But this change is haphazard and without clear direction. We are stumbling and groping our way to a new relationship with nature, the land, and what it grows. Our awareness of soil as the medium for what we grow is ancient. But so too is our awareness that soil is the origin of our world, that which carries it, that which sustains it, feeds it, protects it. The Industrial Revolution and agriculture fundamentally altered that awareness. In the vast food factory that became Earth, a complex division of labor developed with its reliance on technologies, to extract more and more food from that medium in which it grows, soil. This industrial understanding of soil needs fundamentally to change. Soil is no mere medium. It contains about 2,500 gigatons of carbon. That's more than three times the amount of carbon in the atmosphere and four times the amount stored in all living plants and animals. It is a vast carbon sink, absorbing 25% of the world's fossil fuel emissions each year. It is also hugely biodiverse, 
accounting for over 25% of all known species. And yet it, like the food we eat, is increasingly remote from our minds. Dirty, smelly, foul tasting. It rarely features in discussions about food. Yet this non-renewable resource, which grows at a rate of about between one to two millimeters every hundred years, is exploited ruthlessly. And while it should be at the center of government policies, it isn't. The UK government's current agricultural transition plan makes references to improving soil health or soil quality a mere three times. A 2023 House of Commons report could only draw on 2010 figures, figures that are were 13 years out of date for that report, to show that intensive agriculture has caused arable soils to lose 40 to 60 percent of their organic carbon. And unlike the EU, the UK government no longer maps soil health. But if you thought things were better across the channel, take note. The current EU farm to fork strategy, part of its Green Deal initiative, mentions soil a total of eight times, and more as an afterthought. Soil health is part of the EU's enabling transition policy, which calls for, and I quote, a mission in the area of soil health and food to develop solutions for restoring soil health and functions. At the heart of this, quote, mission is, quote, new knowledge and innovations. But why new when there is an abundance of old knowledge? It is in this context that we might look back to the 19th century for instruction. For it is then that the industrialization of agriculture began and with it a growing remoteness from soil, food, and nature. The view of nature as a complex web of life in which science understood it holistically as a complex circulatory organization whose vitality and coherence could be altered either positively or negatively by human activity gave way to an idea of linear and constant innovation in which humans could perfect nature, augment her power to serve humanity. Yet this 19th century change was not straightforward. The publication of Thomas Robert Malthus's an essay on the principle of population established the principle of nature's circular economy. The complex circulatory organization whose vitality and e equilibrium were altered by human activity was summarized in the principle of population. The challenge Malthus's essay posed was how could agriculture be made more productive to meet the growth in population? The answer lay in the work of Malthus's contemporary, Jean-Baptiste Lamarck. In Lamarck's 1802, Recherche sur l'organisation des corps vivants, and then his 1809, Philosophie zoologique, a work that anticipated Darwin's origin of the species by half a century, established that all natural phenomenon were capable of adaptation, and that nature and humanity were governed by discoverable laws whose systematic application could make both more efficient. Lamarck was a hugely controversial figure, but his work had a decisive impact in France, where it marked thinking in the all-important École Polytechnique, the first modern engineering school. There, modern chemistry developed under the auspices of Antoine Lavoisier, Claude-Louis Berthollet, Joseph-Louis Gay-Lussac. Alongside this triumvirate, we must add the name of Jean-Antoine Jean Chaptal, whose 1790s Elements du Chimie brought the term nitrogen into Lavoisier's new chemical nomenclature. Chaptal was a key figure in the industrial, in industrialization of France and Napoleon and during the Bourbon restorations. As founder of the Society for the Encouragement of National Industry, he was a central figure in not only the development of industry in France, but in her development of industrial agriculture. 
1823 Chimie Appliquée à l'Agriculture was hugely important to this, isolating the chemical elements to plant growth and establishing a scientific approach to agriculture. To this work, we must mention Humphrey Davies' 1813 Elements of Agricultural Chemistry, a work that analyzed the role of nitrogenous manure, particularly guano, as a fertilizer. Alongside Chaptal and Davy, we must add the German chemist Justus von Liebig. Liebig, like Chaptal, worked closely with Berthollet and Gay-Lussac, and through Gay-Lussac became friends with the famous naturalist Alexander von Humboldt. Liebig's work with the French led him to apply his theoretical knowledge from organic chemistry to the problem raised by Malthus. Just as Chaptal's Chimie Appliquée à l'Agriculture revolutionized agriculture, so too Liebig's 1840 Organic Chemistry and its application to agriculture and physiology permitted the idea that chemistry could revolutionize agricultural practice, yielding uh, increasing yields and lowering costs. Central to this was Liebig's theory of mineral nutrients set out in the first half of the book, we identified the chemical elements of nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium as essential to plant growth. Like Davies' elements, uh, elements of agricultural chemistry, the impact of this work would be monumental, not least because it gave a scientific basis to what Humboldt discovered in 1804, which was that guano was a concentrated source of nitrogen critical to plant growth. Soon after the publication of Liebig's Organic Chemistry began the frenzied exploitation of guano from islands off the coast of Peru. These veritable open pit mines, which in 1870 produced more than 700,000 tons of guano, yielded vast fortunes and reaped a grim harvest in human lives among those who worked them. The mines were also the center of a war between Peru and Spain in 1864. And then between 1879 and 1883, between Peru, Bolivia, and Chile, a war that claimed more than 18,000 lives. The mining and trade in guano established a long supply chain in agriculture. Guano was transported from Peru to France and Britain, over 18,000 kilometers, a journey that took between 40 and 50 days. It also established an industrial agriculture that viewed soil as a resource whose nutrients could be extracted and replenished artificially. This is what we might describe as a destruction and repair model of agriculture. With the discovery in 1902 of the Oswald process and then 1909 of Haber-Bosch process, artificial fertilizers would come to replace guano. These developments reinforced the view of soil as a resource whose nutrients could be extracted and replenished artificially. And this posed a problem, not least because Liebig's theory of mineral nutrients, the first part of his organic chemistry and its application to agriculture, was twinned with an analysis of the chemical mechanisms of putrefaction and decay, which made up the second part of his organic chemistry and its application to agriculture. Liebig's awareness of both synthesis and degradation led him to voice concerns over the abundant use of imported fertilizers to overall soil health. As an early advocate of soil conservation and the recyclage of sewage, Liebig could see how the artificial replenishment of soil might prove problematic. And it is on this point that a long forgotten chapter to Malthus's challenge might be usefully exams. In 1842, Liebig's student, Charles Gerhardt, published a, trans a French translation of Liebig's organic chemistry. The translation had an immediate impact, not least on a former student of the Ecole Polytechnique, the hydrologist and agronomist Pierre Ural Casayou. Casayou is in the center of this picture. 
Kazei and that's his uh, certificate, that's his um, entry card into the Ecole Polytechnique with all of his details. Kazei would make light of Liebig's understanding of synthesis and degradation and advance as an alternative to the importation of guano, the novel idea of capital in manure. The ideas of synthesis and degradation and capital in manure were set out in a long 1843 article for Pierre Leroux and Jean Reynaud's Encyclopédie Nouvelle, and then in Casaillou's own Considérations sur les Anglais. Both works would have a profound impact on Pierre Leroux and his idea of the circulus, or nature's circular economy. Malthus's essay posed the same and a different problem for Pierre Leroux, as it did for Casaillou and Liebig. Viewed as perhaps the most widely revered social thinker of his day, Leroux was an extraordinary intellectual and activist. The writer Saint-Beuve would come to him for her ideas and inspiration. Alphonse de Lamartine predicted he would be the Rousseau of the 19th century. Jules Michelet, Victor Hugo, Ernest Renan, all came under his influence. Marx described him a genius. In a series of articles for La Revue Sociale in 1846, republished in 1849 as Malthus et les économistes, Leroux highlighted the problem of the industrialization of agriculture. How industrial agriculture, at the same time as increasing yields, was diminishing the human and natural condition. As with the mechanization of industry, the mechanization of agriculture was, as Leroux sarcastically observed, turning it into, and I quote, an agriculture that can do without men. This was the artificialization of the natural world. Against the industrialization of agriculture, Leroux advanced the idea of a bioeconomy with nature's circular economy or the circulus at its core. Aux États de Jersey, sur un moyen de quintupler la production agricole du, du pays of 1853, set out in detail what he called, and I quote, the true law of nature, the natural circle or circulus. Nature's circle, half of which is called production, the other half consumption, was from Leroux's pen, in effect, the union of the two halves of Liebig's organic chemistry. Leroux's idea of the circulus built on a development and extensive agriculture and scientific literature advocating the use of human excrement in agriculture. It also emerged out of the lived experience of an agricultural community that he and his brother Jules established in Boussac in 1842. Exiled to Jersey, after Napoleon III's 1851 coup d'état, the Leroux re-established their community at Samarais, and Jules carried it forward in California, where it continued long after his death. In the 20th century, the circulus faded from view, yet the core idea of the use of human excrement in agriculture was widely endorsed by agronomists, political economists, social investigators, and writers both in and outside of France. Victor Hugo, who shared the same, he shared his exile in Jersey with Pierre and Jules Leroux, devoted pages of Les Miserables, that's dated from 1862, to advocating the use of human excrement in agriculture. Agronomists, including Maxime Poulet, did likewise. The social investigator Henry Mayhew in his 1862 London Labour and the London Poor described as, quote, a great evil, which society with one consent pronounces filth, the evacuations of the human body, is not only washed away into the Thames and the land so deprived of a vast amount of nutriment, but that these very evacuations were then washed back into London's drinking water. Mayhew highlighted the rich paradox that, quote, we import guano and drink a solution of our own feces. 
And the American journal, The Working Farmer, advocated the use of human excrement in agriculture, contending, quote, the food of man being chosen from the more progressed organisms has its constituents in a condition to be readily appropriated by the higher class of plants. And it's for this reason that the excreta of man surpasses all other manures. Its value consisted both in its ability to furnish ammonia to the soil and its ability to enrich it through, quote, the peculiar condition of the inorganic matter it contains for being derived from higher sources in nature and therefore ready for easy assimilation by crops. Pierre Leroux was not unique or isolated in his reflections on the use of human excrement in agriculture. Where he was unique was in how in combining both dimensions of Liebig's thought in the natural cycle or circulus, he established an intimate connection between humans and what they eat, a connection that industrial agriculture through its lengthy supply chains and many futurist foods is fragmenting. Leroux's circulus foregrounds a connection between humanity, soil, food, and the earth, whose time, perhaps, may indeed have come. Thank you. Many thanks, Michael, an absolute tour de force, if I may say, uh, and, and questions I'm already, <laughs> as I pop that up, um, uh, questions are, are coming in. Um, but, I, you know, I think it's uh, it's remarkably striking at the at the way that really when people talk about the future of food, um, in fact, they need to look to the past of food for solutions. So the first question is really asking you a very present day um, a question, which is, what do you think the effect of Brexit has been on UK agriculture? Zero is my honest answer. I think UK agriculture has already uh, been long since the 19th century industrializing rather rapidly. And if we look at the long view, I'm not sure Brexit has made any difference to that change. Where I think it's made a huge difference is to farmers' lives. Uh, I think it's uh, the, the obstacles to markets and to trade uh, are hugely problematic for farmers. But that's a consequence, again, of the industrial agricultural system that has evolved over the last 150 years uh, with long supply chains and everything else. Um, I really think that we, we need to think very carefully about getting to a different form of agriculture, biodynamic, regenerative, organic, um, what have you. I, I'm, I'm just, I'm not convinced that an industrial model for agriculture, certainly not in its present form, um, is the solution to this. So the... Short answer to the question is I'm not sure that Brexit has made a profound difference to a long-term trend. Um, I do think it has made a short-term difference to farmers and it's made their lives a lot more difficult. That's for certain. And you just need to listen to farming today every day to see in the, the myriad ways in which that's happened. Uh, the life of a UK farmer is extraordinarily difficult right now. I mean, I was especially struck in a way by, and, and your answer there touches on it a little bit, by the fact that um, you're, you're, you're drawing on thinkers, um, and, and, and Lou is, is fascinating. So I think, you know, what I should have plugged really is that you're also working on a book on, on Pierre Lou. I didn't plug that one. Um, but but you don't draw on farmers' view of what's happening to the changing patterns of, of farming as they experience it from the 19th into the 20th century. Um, it, it, does that come into your work or? Uh... It would. I mean, you know, how can one talk about agriculture? You know, uh, I, I'm not a farmer. Uh, I grew up near farms, but I actually grew up in a mining town. Uh, uh... Farmers, in, you know, they invest their livelihoods, huge amounts of capital going to machinery, uh, 
We have agricultural policies going back decades, which encourage farmers to, to, to work with this kind of destruction and repair model of agriculture. Um, and, and of course, we, we speak repeatedly of, you know, economies of scale. I mean, if you look at, uh, you know, if you look at this, this speech that Michael G Gove gave, uh, farming for the next generation, you know, a hands-free farm with drilling, harvesting, picking, and automated. I mean, this is, this is a profound disconnection from the land. So I'm, um, but by the same token, a farmer's invested huge amounts of money uh, in a way of growing food, though we like to call it producing food, but in a way of growing food. And, and, and of course, they're bound up with that. Um, I think, you know, if you read Sarah Langford and others, there's a, there, there is a sense in which a lot of farmers are giving up that uh, and trying to move to regenerative farming uh, and finding that actually uh, they have a cl closer connection with what they're growing, uh, whether that's crops or animals, uh, the people they're selling their products to, uh, with the land, with nature, and, and and all of those things, and I think those are beneficial. Um, but you know, if you've if you've invested millions of pounds in tractors and other machinery, uh, you're not going to uh, immediately turn around and say, "Yeah, I'm going to give all that up and I'm going to go uh, to regenerative farming and I'm going to start using human excrement on my fields." Yeah. I mean, it also is also the tension, which you hinted at a little bit um, around the problem of hunger and the relationship between the need to use some type of technology. To, I mean, that's partly what that hands free farming is getting at. It's shooting the seed into the soil in a particular way that doesn't disturb the soil, um, but it's still industrial farming. Uh, and, and the next question in the chat gets at that a little bit, too, which is um, Nigel's asking what you think about the construction of large solar farms on agricultural land. Does that improve or damage the soil? Uh, well, in a in a way, you could argue that it improves the soil because it's a form of set aside. So you're not using the soil uh, if you're using solar panels. Um, I think the land would be more usefully used if we were planting trees on it, and if we improve the soil quality. Um, if you know, we have vast warehouse spaces in this country uh, and that are not used for solar panels. You drive along any motorway, go through Milton Keynes or any other place like that, and you'll see these huge warehouses, which are, you know, hundreds of square, hundreds of thousands of square meters. You know, you could put solar panels on all of those. Instead, we don't do any of that. Um, there's there's a kind of disjuncture all over the place here. Uh, the next question, in a way, gets at, well, suggests something joining together um, from Benjamin Morgan, uh, who asks, is it not possible to combine a smart farm with breaking that destruction and restoration model? A smart farm could perhaps cope well with the dynamic model you propose. I suppose a, a follow-up might be, what would a smart farm look like in the 21st century? If Pierre yeah, LaRue... not, you know, at no point would I, would I suggest that, you know, we go back to agriculture in its 18th century form. Yeah, I think that we can incorporate uh, technologies, but do that in a manner in which, uh, in which we're, not, we're not destroying and then repairing the soil. Um, the last slide here, you know, which is from the Biennale uh, in 2023 of Finland's exhibition, ex exhibition of a composting toilet, right? In which, in which you know, your human waste is comp composted and you could then spread that as fertilizer on your garden. You don't have to go out to the garden center to buy fertilizer, you've got it there. Uh, and then you don't have all, of course, the pollution of water courses and everything else that we're currently experiencing um, through what the, what the French called, they had a wonderful expression, les goutous, so that ubiquitous sewer in which everything is pumped into the sewer and then it just you know disappears magically from 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 our vision. Um, so that would be, and that's why I concluded with this slide, that would be one way in which we could think about this. And I know a number of schemes, uh, you know, of communities, uh, new eco hotels in which these things are being used. Um, 
So that that would that would be a, an ancient solution to a modern day problem. But we could do do that intelligently and do that, you know, in a in a smart farm environment, as it were. Yeah. The next question really gets at uh, the complexities and challenges of the modern food system, which is where you began um, from Edward Stiles, who says, I think the length of supply chain or food miles only tells part of the story. An avocado produced anywhere has a lower carbon footprint than beef from the cow in your garden. So the question that follows is how do we realistically change diets and attitudes to food when so many people in the UK lack the money, knowledge, equipment and so on to eat well? And of course, that's a very it's a big question that, you know, it's not just addressed at you. It's addressed at people. who. No, it's, you know, a hugely, but... it's a hugely complicated question, because also, as I said in my presentation, um, you know there are there are huge financial interests in maintaining the system as it currently operates. Uh, you know the the concentrations. Uh, I mean, basically, you know, five. Well, in the UK, what about seven or eight supermarkets control over eighty percent of the markets? You know, I mean, this these the, these are these are huge profit making enterprises that are not so keen on changing our diets and food producers you know producing miss molly's ice cream you know i mean again there are these huge financial interests um that 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 are resistant to change um where i think you know the the questioner is asking how are we going to change our attitudes and i think what's partly dr driving his question is like, you know, can we change consumer attitudes and therefore get consumers to then say, I want something different. Um, that's a, that's a, that's a possible way forward. But of course the forces that resist that, you know, there's so much marketing. Uh, then of course we have the ubiquitous uh, complaint about the nanny state telling us what we should and shouldn't be eating, what we should and shouldn't be drinking, um, all of those things. And then, of course, um, our labeling systems don't really adequately demonstrate to us, you know, whether something is good for you or not. I mean, it may have green labels. Well, a can of Coke has a bunch of green labels on it. Yeah. And yet it's got, what is it, 12 spoonfuls of sugar in it? And God knows else what else is in it. Yeah. So I think yeah. they're, they're, you know, I think it's going to be an extraordinarily difficult um, move. Uh, and that's, and I'm just speaking about the UK. I mean, there's a lot of resistance in Europe to, to the equivalent of green labeling. Uh, the Italians aren't signed up to it because a lot of their traditional produce doesn't actually, you know, it's high in fats and other things. And so, you know, their manufacturers are resistant and farmers are resistant to that kind of thing. So it's it's a hugely complicated issue with a lot of very powerful players. Yes, it's one of the things that's really striking about food, isn't it? That it all of its governance exists in the private domain. You know, it's really striking and, and you know, even kind of agreeing a nutritional standard, you know, what was actually a good thing for you to eat, you know, and the value of a calorie, all of that's contested. So sort of scaling that up is quite something. So a few more questions. I may I may put a couple together, if I may. So um, someone has asked from your interesting talk that you find yourself, it's interesting phrasing, you find yourself supporting George Monbiot's thesis, Regenesis, Feeding the World Without Devouring the Planet. Uh, so it's a kind of a statement, but a question mark at the end of it. And then from Lucas Baker, um, who asks, how might citizens in the UK and US assuage the problem of highly unhealthy, almost synthetic food? Would you think millions of people changing their buying habits subtly to change what is produced uh, or regulation? Or do you think something else would be helpful? So I suppose that question is pushing you a little bit more at the complexities. If you were granted a power, or, or, you know, to kind of, you know, make one key intervention in the food system, what would it be? <laughs> well, that's <laughs> complicated because because there's so many dimensions to this. Yeah. Um, you know, my presentation talks about soil. We hardly pay any attention to that. Yeah. Okay. And yet it's well, hugely important to the climate, to the environment, uh, 
to to retaining water. Uh, so you know, highly compacted soils, the water will run off on these soils. Um, and the the figures are quite staggering. I mean, a, a very a very um, humus rich soil, which is a healthy soil, will absorb ninety five percent of the water that falls on it. A compacted soil will absorb at best five percent. Hmm. Uh, so I mean, and that of course has huge implications for agriculture, for the planet, and for everything else. Um, I'm going to be losing sight of, and then there's of course the monopoly controls. So all of these huge, huge manufacturers of food or huge supermarkets. I mean, it, it's too simple to say that you know we 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 regulate nutritional standards that might be oh, that certainly would be laudable. We should perhaps think about it. But then, of course, there are all the complexities in that and how that's all negotiated and, and worked yeah. through. Uh, yeah. If I had a magic wand, um, well, certainly one of the first things that I would cause to disappear would be Miss Molly's ice cream uh, <laughs> and, and, and any other thing that's not really what it purports to be. Um, uh, and get back to get back to some real food, uh, less meat and some real food, whatever that means in a way. Yeah, well, I think you've got two things there, really. You've got the sort of the I think you've also come up with a new a new label, better labeling or, you know, accurate labeling and and and, and a measure that, that signals the kind of relationship of the food that's produced to the soil that it's notionally come from if it hasn't come from a lab. Um, the final question I think we have time for is from Ricky Tahata, who asks, but for homes with septic tanks, doesn't human excrement eventually end up in the soil anyway? Uh, okay, no. <laughs> our oceans, lakes, and when it does end up on the soil, uh, because the big uh, water companies uh, sell processed sewage, so processed human waste, they sell it to farmers. Uh, um, it's full of microplastics. In fact, Thames Water is being, there's a civil court action against Thames Water because it hasn't updated, it hasn't improved, it hasn't modernized its water treatment plants. Uh, and as a consequence, there are all of these microplastics which are finding their way onto farm soil. Uh, and that's a huge problem. Um, uh, so uh, the short answer is that human excrement um, I mean, in, a, in terms of a kind of co cosmic uh, circular economy, yeah, I guess so. Uh, but then, then, but then, it's of course inflicting huge damage on 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 on, on water courses, on rivers, on the oceans, and on ourselves. Thank you. And on that note. Uh... Thank you very much again to Michael for an absolutely super talk and to all of you for joining and the great questions uh, in the chat. Um, Michael is easily found. So if something else occurs to you, I'm sure <laughs> he'd welcome he'd welcome it. But but perhaps he might not be in a position to answer in the next week or so as we're in the seventh week of term crashing into eighth week next week. And I'm sure all of you remember what that's like. Um, so the next academic lecture in the series is on the 18th of April uh, from 5 to 6 p.m. by Dr. Paolo Savage um, with, it actually sounds like a great follow-on to tonight's talk, workarounds for complex problems, uh, and the invite will be sent out to all members very soon. Thank you once again. Bye. Bye.